We're live. All right, guys, we are live. Devin Menino, our producer, says we're live, so uh, I guess that's the sign that we're live. Guys, welcome. My name is Nate Zielinski. You are watching Tightline Live. Guys, the entire concept of this show is to bring fishing education and information to you, the angler, and hopefully help you catch more and bigger fish. So again, welcome to Tightline Live. Guys, this entire show is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops. So huge thanks to Bass Pro Shops for being our presenting partner, as well as letting us go live from their page. If you're watching from the Bass Pro National page again, huge thanks for joining us, and we're excited to be here. Also, huge thanks to Bass Pro Shops Denver regionally uh, for letting us go live from there page as well as obviously all our fans at Tightline Outdoors. We also have a great guest coming tonight. We're going live from his page as well. So uh, James Niggermeyer, we're bringing you live from your page. Uh, so for all your guests watching us now, again, huge thanks to them for following this as well as Icefish Colorado guys. A huge support in Colorado from them during all of our tournaments. Uh, so huge thanks for letting us go live from their page and having them, uh, all their viewers watch us tonight. So again, guys, we're going live from a lot of platforms. We've got a lot of different anglers nationwide watching this. Uh, but guys, again, we're just excited to be here uh, and hopefully you're excited to be here as well and again huge thanks to Bass Pro Shops. Again, if this is the first time watching this show, the general concept here is to bring in education, fishing concepts, tactics, you know, things that just we think that'll make you a better angler, and we're going to just talk about them. I mean, during our guests, you, it's all about interaction. You can send us your comments. We'll answer them live. And again, it's just about that interaction to make everybody a better angler and hopefully catch more and bigger fish. We're based here in Colorado, but we spend time all across the country targeting all species. Uh, so again, if you have a question about anything, send it in, and uh, if we can't answer it, We'll figure out somebody who can, and we'll get all of your questions answered. Um, again, our, we're going to be going live with James here just shortly in about 10 minutes. But until then, I always start off talking about some sort of topic of the night. We want to talk about things that we're going to talk about. Tonight, we actually have two things that we want to talk about. Number one, I want to talk about the concepts of hard baits versus soft baits. And with that regard, it's talking about very similar presentations. Uh, for example, talking about a hard jerk bait and a soft jerk bait. Generally speaking, do almost the same thing in the water, but obviously very different baits. So we're going to be talking about hard versus soft baits just real quick, uh, just to kind of have that uh, the influence of what we should be doing. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about, guys, is old school techniques. And what's the... What's the general take on old school versus new school? Um, and a lot can be said with that. You know, whether it's the fish have forgotten about a certain presentation or tactic because again we've moved on to more advanced things and that technique or those baits can come relevant again because the fish haven't seen them in so long and two how many times do ourselves as anglers make things too complicated and if you can just keep it simple a lot of times how much more success you'll have so those are the two things we're going to talk about uh tonight as we kind of start the show then we'll kind of go up from there um first thing like we want to talk about we want to talk about hard baits versus soft baits because again I get this question a lot. People are always asking, hey, Nate, when you're out targeting big, giant northern pike, or you're out targeting you know, largemouth, smallmouth bass, or, or trout, or whatever we're going for, you know, what's the concept between the, the hard and the soft baits? And I think the biggest thing that I personally get this question about is targeting big predators like big northern pike or big lake trout. We do a lot of that, especially as we uh, approach springtime, you know, coming up here in March, April, May. Um, we start targeting a lot of those big lakers and a lot of those big pike, and we'll start saying, hey, you've know, you got to go throw swim baits. And a lot of times when you hear swim baits, everybody's like, man, you're talking swim baits, you're talking plastics, you're talking paddle tails, you know, things like that. And in reality, sometimes these swim baits, you know, we're just talking about big jointed hard baits. We call that a swim bait. It's got a lip on it, you know, but as this goes through the water, we're going to call it a hard swim bait. So there's a lot of variations of baits. You, know, you talk about swim baits. Again, you have completely hard baits. You have 100% completely soft baits. You have concepts of both to where you have a, a soft body with a molded head. Uh, you see a lot of that stuff in like the savage baits. You see a lot of that in the storm baits. Um, so there's a lot of variations. And really, when do you use what? So generally speaking, you know, you're going to have a, a certain portion of the country, regionally, um, that your fish just prefer one versus the other. <coughs> Excuse me. For me speaking... If I had to say, hey, Nate, you got to build a pattern. When do I use soft? When do I use hard? Um, generally speaking, the colder the water on the beginning half of the year, I use hard baits, and I fluctuate into soft baits as I get, number one, warmer water, and two, as I get toward the second half of the season. So if you were going to say, hey, ice off for you know, early spring, we're saying March, April, May, uh, that point in time, I almost always favor the hard baits. So the hard style swim baits, the hard style jerk baits. Um, again, I'm looking for a plastic wood. I'm looking for a molded body out of some sort of acrylic uh, that's going to be hard. I think it gives you 
more flash. I think it gives you a little bit more crisper action, uh, maybe a little bit more control, and probably the control is probably the big thing uh, to keep a bait in the strike zone as your fish are lower on energy. Um, and again, just staying in that strike zone is going to produce more bites. As opposed to you get a little bit later in the season, you start getting to where new bait fish life is starting to spawn out. So you have new food uh, in the fall. Maybe you're working baits a little faster. Again, the fish have more more activity. Um, and a bait like this, you know, like a soft jerk bait, um, this bait falls real slow, but doesn't necessarily suspend as opposed to uh, to a true jerk bait. So again, this bait stays in the strike zone a little longer and is a little more flawless in control. This bait here is going to be moving throughout it. Now, the only nice thing about this bait is sometimes it can look more natural and without a doubt when they grab hold of this bait they know instantly hey this feels right it's squishy it feels fleshy it feels like something natural as opposed to the hard jerk bait when they grab that they know the gig is up they know nothing that they have ever ate in the last five years of their life has that texture has that feel a lot of times they try to spit it out. So there's a lot of variations with that being said, but the the concept of hard versus soft is something that I think we're we're getting more and more questions on. I think so many anglers either have confidence in one versus the other, and I think a lot of anglers don't pay attention to that. They are like, hey, a swim bait's a swim bait, whether it's hard body or soft body, you know, it's a swim bait. And I think in reality, you almost have to think about those variations of, hey. You know, at this particular lake, this particular species, this particular time of year, they prefer one versus the other. And it's pretty dramatic for us. So, talking big pike, you know, we spend a lot of time gardening big giant pike here in the western states, Colorado, um, even the Midwest. And without a doubt, if I'm talking that, that peak time frame of post-spawn fish in May, early June, um, I'm probably going to get, you know, 10 to 1 strikes and bites on a hard bait versus soft bait, whether that's a hard jerk bait or a hard swim bait. Um, so again, if you miss that opportunity, you're like, hey, a swim bait's a swim bait, and you go out fishing a soft swim bait um, early in that time of year, you're not gonna have the opportunity that you would using a hard bait. Uh, then you go out in the fall, September, October, November, targeting these big pike, um, and you go on that same presentation and you fish the hard bait, you're one in 10 versus the soft bait. So again, how many of you pay attention to that type of stuff? It's important, and more, more than anything nowadays, you have a lot of options of both. You have a ton of soft plastic baits. You have a ton of hard body baits, and you really, you the angler, have to play with it, have to build your own patterns, build your own experiences of when you should be using what and, and how the fish are, are approaching and or liking one versus the other. But again, hard versus soft, uh, again, it's a, it's a huge opportunity. There's opportunities for both. Uh, but again, who out there has paid attention to that? Who's watching that? Because again, it's a it's a huge topic. And I think nowadays you're seeing more and more baits. You know, you look at the Berkeley line of products, they're making more swimming minnow style baits. Um, again, you know, a direct descendant of say things like uh, like a jigging wrap. Um, you're seeing the soft plastic bodies of that. Um, same kind of thing in the crankbait world. I know uh, our producer Devin Menino right here behind me uh, is the master of this. So you take a bait like this, a glass shad wrap, very normal crankbait. It's a size five. This bait catches everything, catches smallmouth, largemouth, catches walleyes. It's a dynamite bait. You know, this bait, I don't know, seven, eight bucks, nine bucks. And nowadays, you're starting to see so much of the small variations. You know, you have a, a shad-style soft bait. You can do everything with this bait that you can almost do with this bait. Again, this bait costs pennies on the dollar, and again, it's hard versus soft. There's variations to both. When do the fish like each of them? But again... So many people that have always fished this have never tried this. And a lot of times in different cases, this bait is going to do better. And I mean, you talk about fishing early spring when we're fishing around a lot of cover. I avoid cover in the spring when I'm fishing this bait because at $7, $8 a pop, I don't want to get near the trees. I don't want to get near the rocks because you can lose 100 baits a day. 100 baits or 100 of these a day would kill me. I can probably afford to lose 100 of these a day. So I fish in areas that I normally wouldn't fish. And I catch more and bigger fish. So again, there's a lot of things about it, but guys, that's the starting topic of the night. Hard versus soft. We're going to talk to James to get his opinion on that when he comes on here uh, in just a couple minutes. But the other thing we want to talk about real quick before we jump off is old school versus new school. Because that's, again, the, the same topic that we're talking about here is, you know, the guy, uh, the modern angler is probably fishing both these style jerk baits, Or maybe even just more soft, because, again, it's, it's a modern trend. Um, as opposed to the old school guy is just using baits like that. And, you know, you look uh, across the board from the bass world to the walleye world to the, you know, pike world, whatever. 
there's so many variations of, of how you approach things. And the reason I want to talk about this is we just got done at a big sports show. So I just wrapped up doing some seminars at a big sports show and I was hanging out with a group of, of other anglers, you know, guides and, and pretty professional anglers. And there was a young person that came up and just said, hey, you know, he's five, six years old. And he's like, I want to go out and I want to catch a bunch of fish. I want to catch panfish. I want to catch some bass. How do I do so? And you look across this, uh, this group of anglers and we had one angler saying, hey, throw a soft jerk bait, you know, real small soft jerk bait, you're going to catch them. One guy said, hey, throw a small popper, they're going to grab it and, and, and go with it. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I'm like, what did I do when I was five years old? And, you know, I used a bobber and a worm. So, you know, this kid came to me and it was my turn to speak and I said, hey man, you know, get bait. Use a bobber and a worm, a bobber and a minnow. And it's old school and it catches fish. But yet, we've been trained so much as anglers to, to preach technology, to preach the current trends. And again, a lot of times these trends catch a lot of fish, but on other cases, going back to the basics, going back to old school techniques can catch a ton of fish. And I mean, you look at right now, so down my producer, flip the camera around, can we show you? <clears throat> I don't have that camera on. Sorry. Doesn't have the camera on. I'm going to make him spin it around. So, Devin's sitting right here. You know, when we go out guiding together, Devin and I guide together. We spend a lot of time on the water together. Devin follows, I wouldn't say follows the trends, but he is cutting edge with baits. You know, so we'll go out fishing, and I'm like, man, what are you catching that fish on? And it's, it's a bait that got released three months ago. And I'm the guy that wants the bait to be on the market five years before I use it. It's just who I am. I tend to be the old school angler. And a lot of times the new school angler uh, has those things dialed in. And I can say it works both ways. There's a lot of times where I am catching a lot more fish on old school techniques. I have confidence in it and it catches fish. And there's a lot of days where I miss opportunities because I don't have the latest and greatest. I don't have the the technology and certain baits that allow an angler to catch more fish on that given day. Um, so again, we're talking general concepts and really more than anything, I want to spark uh, a little, you know, put a spark in your mind and in your eye of, of things that we might overlook. Again, hard versus soft baits, huge thing to think about. And then old school versus new school. Everybody nowadays, especially if you're, you know, a, a very frequent angler, you miss out on opportunities because you're so cutting edge. You know, you, you overlook what used to work. And again, if it worked at one point in time, more than likely at some point, it's going to work again. Uh, so again, those type of things uh, are huge to think about. They might be able to catch you more fish at the end of the day. So again, think about that kind of stuff. Now, we're going to go to the phones here in just a second. Uh, we're going to be talking to our good friend, James. Uh, and we're going to be asking him these same questions. And again, if you want to interact, guys, we have literally got an elite angler. Uh, guys, he has fished professionally for 12 years. Uh, he has fished on the highest levels of competitions in the bass fishing world. He's also a Bass Pro Cabela's Pro Angler. Uh, so guys, this this guy has all of the information uh, that you guys want to be hearing. So let me get in my earpiece and we're going to bring James on and uh, we're going to ask him these questions. Again, if you want to interact, you want your questions answered, now is the time to be interactive. Make sure you bring your questions, comment to all your friends, share this post, bring them on here because like, guys, right now we are bringing in the king of information. So guys, we're going to live in front of us. we got James Diggermeister. How are you, sir? Doing great, Nate. How are you? I'm fantastic, man. You know, we, uh, we're excited to have you on here. We've been jumping all over the place. You know, last week we talked to a rod manufacturer. The week before that we were talking to professional ice fishermen. I mean, we jump across the board, and we have got, you know, followers watching right now from, from Florida to California to, to Canada to Texas. So we've got a gamut of anglers, and I can say that a lot of times uh, in winter we get so focused on ice, we overlook a lot of the bass fishing world, and really the bass fishing world never slows down, you know. In Colorado here in the, in the Rockies, you know, when we freeze up, we kind of overlook certain species. And, uh, you know, right now, I mean, the, some of the biggest bass tournaments in the country are kicking off right now. Um, it's just that time of year to where, where the bass mindset's there. So we wanted to bring you on and, uh, you know, just, just have you on to, to talk bass fishing, talk general concepts. And uh, I got a couple questions for you. But real quick, walk everybody through who you are as an angler. Well, my, uh, I've been fishing the Pro Tour both the Elite Series, actually for 11 years, now the FLW, over the last 12 years. And um, really just so passionate about the sport. Uh, ever since I was really little, my dad got me started fishing for trout in the high Sierras of California. And in 2001, I moved to Texas really to pursue this. And, and also I started guiding on Lake Fork. And I still do a little bit of that as well. 
but really I'm, 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 it's a dream come true. I'm really blessed to be able to do, to fish for a living. That's, that's always been the dream and um, it's just, it still is exciting and I, and I absolutely love it. That's awesome, man. That's cool. I appreciate you coming on again. So, before we go to questions, we're going to get a lot of questions. You always have to talk about this stuff. But before that, I introduced the show talking about hard baits versus soft baits. And again, I tend to be an old school angler. As people watch the show, they learn that. If, if people that know me and have followed my career, um, I'm all about the old school. You know, again, I, I want a trend or a concept to be out five years before I pick it up. It's just who I am. Um, and there's a lot of anglers that jump on every trend, and I think that there's value to each side of that. You know, if it, if it caught fish at one point in time, it probably will again. And if it's cutting edge, the fish have never seen it, and there's new technology, it catches a lot of fish as well. So there's a lot of different things going into it, but I want to talk about hard versus soft. You take about a hard jerk bait and a soft jerk bait. When do people know what to do with each? You know, years ago, I don't think we had the soft plastics, or at least they didn't have the capabilities to compete with some of the, the manufactured hard baits, but now they do. And you, as a, as a very competitive bass angler, talk to me about hard versus soft baits, especially when there's opportunity of maybe a very similar bait in both hard and soft. Well, how do you know to use which one, and, and what excels each one of these? Wow, that's a great question. I really feel like to be a well-rounded angler, you really have to do both. Uh, there's some guys out there on tour that really excel with power fishing, hard plastic, you know, uh, crankbaits, uh, spinner baits, have you, and, and you know, jerk baits, top water lures, drawing more of that aggressive reaction strike. And that's great, and generally you catch a little bit better quality fish on some of those baits. But there's also days when they don't want to chase, and, and they're just more lethargic, and you've got to slow down and really soak a soft plastic in and near, you know, around them in the cover that they're utilizing. And a soft plastic actually really enables you to be a more efficient angler. It really, be, it really gives you the opportunity to catch fish in an area that maybe yesterday or even hours ago they were eating uh, hard baits. Now, now they're more susceptible to soft baits. And so really uh, it, it's, like, um, it's like having just really cool, that's the way I look at it, there's some days when you have gotta have that that screwdriver. The other days you gotta have the hammer, and and really um, <laughs> being able to use both is is key. And and I think it's not just key for just the tournament angler. It's key for everyone that goes out there fishing through all the conditions and all the seasons. You're gonna need to have a different tool. There's certain days when they just won't eat either the hard or the soft, and there's a better way to catch them. And that's to me the beauty of the game is really trying to figure out what works best and and sometimes to my disadvantage i'll i'll get on a kick where i'm like man i just i, I know they're going to eat this i know they're going to eat this instead of listening to them and really kind of figuring out well it'd probably be better if i did this instead or or yep. soft plastic slow down and catch more fish so really it's a trial and error process but uh you've really got to have them both and, and i don't know if i'm really i'm not trying to kind of circumvent your your question there but really over experience and time on the water and really just trial and error, you can really get a good idea. And really also season and weather conditions really play a, a big part of whether or not I'm going to go power fishing with hard bait or slow down and, and do the soft plastic stuff. Absolutely. No, and I think that that's a huge, you know, that's the opportunity that you just said to, to really value both. And that's where, again, I think an angler that has an open mind really can excel at the end of the day. That's where, again, I think the – the tournament side of me is very open-minded, and the guide portion of me, I've guided for 18 years, is very close-minded because, you know, you guide the same waters. You know, when you're tournament fishing, you go to new opportunities, new waters, so I think your mind is always forced to be open. And when you guide the, you know, I guide 17 bodies of water, and I've done it for so year, you know, many years. I launch my boat, my boat practically drives to the spot and starts fishing, and, you know, I get close-minded because I'm like, hey, it's worked the last 15 years. We've caught fish the last 15 years. This is what we're going to do. Um, and it's crazy, but, you know, even though I mentally know I need to not do that, it's so easy to fall into those habits, and I think that's huge. You know, and I have a, a, a bass fishing guide that works for me named Matt Inslee, and he, he's a flawless, meticulous finesse guy. You know, he comes in, and he works every spot, and I would say that I could, I could work a shoreline. Let's just say for, for largemouth. And I can work a shoreline and have a good time and say, hey, let's say I worked a shoreline and I caught five good fish. 
you know, and I think that I covered it. But again, I'm more the hard bait, more the power fishing. And he'll come through and whether he makes more precise casts or whatever he does to fish it differently, a lot of times it's the plastic, the slowdown, um, you know, he'll create opportunity at two or three more fish. And a lot of times it's the two or three fish that I miss. You know, he's the guy in the back of the boat that makes, uh, makes up for that. And even though it's just a small portion of more fish, a lot of times it's those bigger fish. And it, and it makes a difference at the end of the day. Oh, sure. And I totally agree with you. Anyone that's spent any amount of time on a particular body of water when, when I'm guiding like Lake Fork, you, you're, you want to be an odds guy. You want to stack those odds in your favor. So you go to those areas, you know, okay, I know fish live here. I know this is, you know, what they're using this time of year. And you go in there. And then obviously, like you said, in the tournament, you're more open-minded and you're, you're more willing to adapt. And definitely, you can definitely catch some fish. I feel like the bigger fish generally like a slower moving presentation. It takes a little, little bit more time in their strike zone before they decide, yeah, I want to eat that. But they're, don't get me wrong, though, those reaction strikes, those days sometimes when those fish, you just burn a crankbait by them, a square bill or a deep diving crankbait, and they just and they hit it, and you catch catching bigger fish than on any other bait. So, again, I, it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but, I mean, it really – Oh, I hear you. And being open-minded for sure makes a big difference. Absolutely. I think Devin's got a question for you real quick. Hey, James. So, pretty broad question, but what is your favorite technique to catch spawning bass in the south? My favorite technique? If I'm visually seeing them, I want to throw some sort of either a tube or a lizard, something like that, add a visual, uh, either a spawning fish or a fish that's cruising, and I want to either throw out in front of him if he's cruising or actually I want to agitate him into biting and, and really try to trick him into, you know, he, they're, when they're on the beds, they get that real defensive posture, they, they get territorial. So running a soft plastic bait, slow and steady through there, and it makes it look like it's kind of coming in there and is an invader into their, their area. That's, that's probably one of my, visually seeing them, that's, that's probably one of my favorites. But if I can't see them in the water stain, but I'm feeling like, yeah, they're on bed, I love to throw a bait like a Strike King Ocho Throw it out there weightless and just let it shimmy down there. Fish it real slow. you got to have serious amounts of patience. It's one of my favorite things because I'll look down a bank and think, there ought to be a bed right there. And then I'll just throw it over there and just fish it real slow and just methodical and work it back real slow and try to soak it in an area that I think's really got a bed fish. And a lot of times you can catch some great fish when they're on beds and you don't, in the springtime, when you don't really, when you visually can't see them. I tell you what, I don't ever want to fish against that guy right there. Everybody's leading him right there, James. Did you see that, Devin? When he was talking about working that bait slow, I feel like he was into it. Like he had his hands on his reel. Like you, you were ready. You're the competition that I don't want to fish against because even you're, you're in your garage and you're ready to set the hook better than I am right there. <laughs> yeah, I, right, we, got, we got another. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, it's just. Fishing is just one of those things, you know, you get excited just talking about it. We're not anywhere near water, although it's pouring out rain outside, but you get excited about it and it just brings back these memories and you go into like on point, like a, like a bird on a, on a, I mean, on a dog, on a bird or something like that. I hear you, man. I got a bunch more to talk to you about, but we got questions, so let's answer the questions here real quick. People are excited to ask you some questions, man. All right. A, a fellow named Dustin Sigler wants to know, what, what did it take for you to become a professional angler? He wants to know the path that you took to become a professional angler. Wow, it's different for everyone. My my path took I took a while actually. I, I really started out fishing federation tournaments. I actually started fishing in a club when I was about eighteen, and then I started fishing some team tournaments, and then the federation, and then from there I went to fishing as a co angler or an amateur at the back of the boat and with a pro and really tried to have a degree of success at every level before I took the next jump. And um, I really felt like that was kind of my, my gauge, okay, am I ready, am I ready? If I had some success, a decent amount of success, that's what would really help me to really make, make my mind up to make that jump and take it to the next level. But I really stair-stepped my way up. I know a lot of guys today, or the younger guys, that they go from like the high school program all the way up to the top level of the sport and that really says a lot about how the sports changed over the years. But generally as a whole, you look at like guys like Mike Iaconelli and um, just every, a lot of the guys just kind of take that stair-step approach. 
and because there's also because there's a lot of expense involved in it. And so if you can start out small fishing club tournament and then team tournaments and kind of stair-stepping your way up in the degree of difficulty and the competition, but also the expense, that's, that's probably the way that, that's the way that I did it. I would probably the way I would suggest most people do it. Absolutely. I think experience is huge. You know, um, you learn a lot. And I think that there's more to the tournament side of fishing than anybody understands, you know, more so than the, the, the skill level. Everybody is like, man, I'm a good stick. I outfish everybody I fish. I'm ready for tournaments. And I, I think the, the concept of, you, know, you look at a pre-fish. And everybody's like, oh, man, you know, so-and-so is out pre-fishing. And, you know, some of these guys might have, what, 20 boats out looking for spots for them, looking for things. I mean, the, there's more of a business associated with it than I think that anybody understands. And I think the, the experience walking up to that in a stair-step level uh, is huge. And I speak for that because I did the opposite. I, I got offered a, a pro staff position with a boat company because I bo broke a boat in half as a guide. They said, hey, Nate, by the way, if we offer you this stuff, you got to fish a couple pro tournaments. And I'm like, I could do that. you know. So I went from never fishing any tournaments to a pro level, and angling skill-wise, I was solid, but no idea what I was getting into because I didn't know the business of, of tournament fishing. And there's a lot to that, and, you know, the etiquette and you know, building a, a foundation of, hey, man, I'm having a tough bite. You know, it's a network. I mean, you need to be able to go to any portion of the country and say, hey, man, get me started. You know, where do I – again, there's just a lot to it. And I think the, the the slower growth really brings on a side of tournament fishing that a lot of people don't know about. And it gives you time to, to build that network and prepare for that. It, it, absolutely, I agree. And then build those relationships with the companies and yep. really start to grow with them as, as you continue to grow. Absolutely. All right, we got one more question. Uh, so everybody's got a confidence bait. What is your favorite top baits, and how do you fish them? Gosh, I, my favorite bait is a jig. I love like a half ounce, either a green pumpkin or a black and blue, like a Strike King Hack Attack jig, or a, um, they have a new fluorocarbon jig. It's awesome, too. I just love to fish a jig. Anytime I can fish a jig, I I'm just feel real confident. Uh, and one of the things I love about it is you catch a little bit better quality fish on average and fishing it slow and methodical. And that's one of the things I think a lot of people, I mean, I know for me, it took me a while to figure out what exactly um, would be best for me in the way of, a, you know, favorite technique of confidence thing. Some guys run around the lake and they, they, you know, they throw a lot, of, a lot of different fast moving reaction style baits and cover a ton of water. And I'm more of a methodical guy. I like to come in, pick apart a section of bank or an offshore spot or whatever it is, and really just try to saturate it and try to figure out what the fish are doing in that one little area. And um, so I know that the jig really fits my personality, and it's just my confidence bait. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the best baits you could ever tie on. and probably one of the hardest to learn, but I, I love it. Absolutely. Now, we got some more questions, but with that, I want to jump into the question that I started my conversation with early in the night is – Old school versus new school. Now, by no means, I think a jig falls into either of those. It's definitely an old bait that's been around forever, but there's a lot of twist to it, and it, it still works. But with that being said, what is a bait that is timeless? What's a bait for you that will never get old? You know, a bait that your dad used or you used when you were a kid that you still use on tour today. And in your opinion, what's one of the most cutting-edge baits or techniques that's the new school thing that, that you can tell people about? Obviously, you get presented with a lot of opportunities to maybe see baits before they even come out of the market. But what's the oldest school presentation or bait that you use? And what's the newest cutting-edge bait that you see uh, being a trend in the, in the industry? I definitely think a jig is as old school as you can get. And but, however, since I talked about that, I'll say another old school bait that's just an amazing lure that gets overlooked a lot today is the spinner bait. We have so many different baits out there that fit in that same type of genre, whether it's a swim jig or a swim bait, different things like that. And and the, the spinner bait's kind of been sidelined as far as you know in the in the limelight or. Or, or, or for the activity, people think, oh, no, the spinnerbait's kind of yesterday. It's still as much a fish catcher today as it ever was. I think it's definitely a bait that you want to take, take into consideration the conditions in which you're throwing it in, whether it's uh, the, you know, the wind, the clouds, the, the sun, different things like that, and the water clarity. But just as much a fish catcher today and catches just great quality fish. 
As far as new baits uh, or new techniques on the scene today, the, that jig, jig head worm, not the shaky head, but that little that thing called a Ned rig today, that's probably <laughs> the most, uh, that's probably the, everyone's kind of talking about that. That's kind of the new, the new buzz that's going on. And really, it's, a, it's one of those baits that, like the shaky head, you can re- literally catch fish anywhere in the country for largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass, regardless of the season. It's just one of those, it's one of those baits that gets a lot of bites. And I think the buzz is out there because people are catching a lot of fish on it right now. So that's probably the thing that's most cutting edge or new on the scene as far as that goes, in my opinion. Absolutely. And we've got a question regarding the Ned Rig. What is your favorite setup as far as lure and weight to go with the Ned Rig? Well, I think the, uh, the for me, it's been more like a 610 St. Croix medium heavy or medium action with like 10 pound tough line braided line to like a fluorocarbon lead or gamma fluorocarbon like seven or eight pound test line something like that in that range it's seven to ten i should say and um like a one sixth ounce is probably the the size that i've used the most and um making a a long cast when it sinks all the way to the bottom on a on a slack line that 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 vertical descent's the key but that's the setup that i like to um i like to throw on that one you know, I'll tell you, there's nothing that drives me crazier than the Ned Rig. So, good little story here. So, a good friend of ours, he, uh, he does a lot of writing for us, um, used to live here. His name's David Harrison. Great guy, writes for in Fisherman. Uh, he's an engineer, fell into fishing because he's like, I don't get it. You know, I do something on this day, I plug in A and B and equal C, and I do it the next day, it doesn't work. And as an engineer's mindset, it drove him crazy. So, he fell in love with fishing, and... He, he's from Kansas, and his parents live next to Ned, right? So him and I are fishing a tournament in, I don't know, 2008, 2009, and he goes, we got to do this thing called a Ned rig. My buddy, my, my parents' neighbor invented it, and, you know, he's got like a cutoff Cinco or whatever, and we're walleye fishing on the Illinois River, and I'm like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And we caught some fish, and he goes, man, he goes, this is like a thing. And I'm like, it's not a thing. And then... You know, all of a sudden, you know, three, four years later, all of a sudden, like, he sends me a, an In Fisherman article, and he's like, look it, it's a thing. And now, it's like the thing. And, you know, when I first saw it, I mean, I, you know, we, we bulk up baits a lot of times, so we'll rip off the back of a jig in, like, a walleye fishing situation. We'll put bait on it. We just piggyback just to bulk it up, just so the fish feel like they have something more visually to see. But, I mean, there's no doubt from a bait that I literally told a good friend who's personal friends with Ned, I was like, this is stupid. It's a dumb thing. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. It catches so many fish and you do non-typical techniques with it. You know, you fish on a slack line and I mean, you can look at a person fishing a Ned rig and you can fish it with literally like slack line and you have to have expert control. And on the other hand, you could be my four-year-old daughter cast it out and I mean, she whacks them on the Ned Rig. I mean, there's so many styles of ways to fish it. And, uh, I mean, it does. It catches fish. I, I got to say, it drives me crazy. Um, but it is a, is a great technique. And it's just funny because I, I saw a little bit of the progression of that. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a catcher, no doubt. Definitely. Awesome. All right, so uh, last thing I got to talk to you about, obviously talking old school, new school, things like that. What are you excited about this year as an angler? As you go forth in, in this coming season, what are you most excited to fish for, and, and what's the hottest bite that you're looking forward to, to fishing this year? Wow. Um, as a touring professional, I get to travel, obviously, all over the country and fish so many different bodies of water. Uh, I, I get to go. We've got a tournament up on St. Clair, world-class smallmouth fishery. That lake has been kind of a challenge for me. So I'm looking forward to going back there and getting a little redemption. Those smallmouth are just big, and they're, there's, it's such a prolific fishery. But because of the makeup of that place, it, the fish tend to be real uh, nomadic. They move a lot, and it's hard to stay on them. You've got to be real open-minded. And I think a lot of times, if, if you take that kind of approach where, you know, well, the wind's blowing this way, and they ought to be over there, so I'm going to go hit that bank, and I think this is the proper bank. It's almost like you got to kind of throw all that out the window and just be like, Man, I'm just fishing in the moment. It's a, it's a, it's a bizarre place, but I'm, I really am looking forward to going there and, and doing well. I mean, because that place is 
has had my number for a while now, and I, I, I know it's a tremendous fishery, and I want to catch them there. But um, so many different places we get to go to, get to get to go to Kentucky Lake. I get to go this year in May, which is yeah, I've never been there in May, and I've heard so much. It's actually, actually, pardon me, it's the end of May, like June, and I've heard so much about that that place in that time frame. And usually we go there when it's the summer and they're offshore. But I think there's going to be a lot of different patterns playing there. And so I'm looking forward to that place as well. It's you know, obviously world-class fishery, full of full of giant largemouth bass and, uh, and big smallmouth for that matter. But uh, looking forward to a couple of those venues for sure. And, and obviously Lake Fork, got a lot of trophy bass in that lake. And looking forward to a great spring there as well. Awesome. So with that being said, I, I've had a similar challenge before, and we, we always call it the no pattern pattern. I'm going to leave, uh, we're going to leave the show on this question, but, you know, I, I again, I'm, I'm not a bass guy, you know, for the most part. I do a lot of walleye fishing. I spend a ton of time on the Detroit River, uh, you know, walleye fishing. Every so often we'll get high flows or crazy wind, so we'll run up to St. Clair and we'll, we'll play with smallmouth. And same thing, I've seen it to where... We rail fish in all that shallow water, and we're like, this is fun. Let's come up here tomorrow, and let's take some photos and do some, some photo stuff. And you show up tomorrow, and there's nothing there. And you're like, what happened to them? And you go to Lake Winnebago for walleyes, it's the exact same. Like, you literally catch fish for five days in a row. Nothing changes. No weather, no clouds, whatever. It's the same. And the fish are 10 miles away, and they move. And there's, there's certain fisheries in the country, and I'm sure... The viewers that are watching this probably live near a lake that's that to them. You know, and we all have that that body of water that just changes and it's hard to pattern. How do you go about that? I mean, obviously, I'm sure you're thinking about it a lot because if that fishery has kicked your butt, just like they have to me, you know, you you hate to go there, but you're excited to go there because obviously, as a fisherman, we love the challenge and we have to break the code. What do you do in that situation? Do you just power fish or what's your goal? Really, the thing that's challenging for me is obviously as, as power as pattern fishermen. Once we get something figured out, we want to stay with that, and and it's like and, and men I think as as a whole where we like once we know the recipe or the formula, it's so hard to break out of that. And really, that's the thing is keeping an open mind. Obviously, it's a challenge for me, especially on that body of water and small mouth. I don't have as much uh, experience as I do large mouth, but keeping an open mind to me is the biggest thing not getting too locked into something that, that worked yesterday or an hour ago and being able to say, okay, I got a full patrolling motor and we're going to run over here. Maybe not full scale change everything if I'm throwing a crankbait, go to say a drop shot, but trying some different areas because obviously these fish have moved. If the conditions haven't changed too much, they should still be susceptible to some of the same presentations, but actually still keeping an open mind where I can actually throw a tube if I need to or throw a drop shot if I need to and, and or switch over to a jerk bait or maybe they come maybe they've moved up in the water column and I need to throw a top water but continuing to move around and basically taking the mindset in my opinion of what, what I would call the the going back to practice because you know at every one of these events we have three days of practice and and I think that's the hardest thing is just saying okay what we're doing is not working we need to take assessment that, you know, this isn't working or that's working. I need to kind of tweak it, but maybe it's a full scale. We need to just go looking again. We need to search and we need to put some, some sort of moving bait in our hands so we can cover water, but also be mindful that we're not fishing over a big school. So throw in some silver presentations and try to keep it, you know, keeping them honest on that front too, because man, those fish will, they'll lie to you in a second. So you got, you got to have a couple different things going. <laughs> And keep an open mind and be able to change up when you have to, for sure. That, 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 and with the open mind, it, absolutely. And staying positive, I think, is the biggest thing there. That's my biggest thing. You know, when I fish those notorious couple bodies of water, for me, it's, you know, it's Winnebago and Devil's Lake. And, you know, when you have fish that just, you know, patterns can change and fish can move. And, you know, you have fish all over the place, but yet certain fish are active. And there's just a couple of bodies of water. I get discouraged so fast, you know. I'll get them for a couple of days, and that first day I lose them. You know, I probably only lose them for 10 minutes, but I, I think back in the last 10 years that I've lost them, and I immediately am, I, I get frustrated. If you get frustrated, it's game over. So keeping your, your head in the game, I think, is, is huge on those bodies of water on top of uh, just having a game plan and, and, and staying open-minded. Yes, absolutely. That mental toughness, that's the test. When things start falling apart, the train, the, the, the train comes off the tracks, being able to go, okay, look, I, hey, I was looking when I found these fish last time. And obviously, I'm preaching to the choir right now. <laughs> because, <when they> <laughs> up, 
you know, when things come apart, you got to go look. I, I know I found them once before. I've got to go back, you know, go back to looking and, and definitely, yeah, keeping your head in the game and believing that, hey, the next cast or coming around this next point or that grass bed or, or this offshore spot or whatever, that could be the next thing and just staying with it and, and staying involved and not getting down. That's that's a challenge for sure. I, I agree with you. I mean, that's it. You know, I just got to tell you, it's just five fish. I caught five in 10 minutes the day before. I got eight hours. I just need the five. So, awesome. James, real quick, tell everybody where they follow you. Obviously, people are watching from all the places. We're getting thumbs up from 20 different places. You know, if people want to follow your career, they want to follow who you are as an angler, and they want to learn more from you, where's the best outlet to learn about you? I'm probably on Facebook as much as anywhere, but I've got a Twitter account. My Facebook channel is James Negemeyer, comma, angler. But I have Twitter, and I have Instagram. And then also, I started a YouTube channel, starting to get some stuff going there. But uh, and I've also have a website at jamesnigemeyer.com. So those are the, the areas that you can a guy could keep up with me and see what's going on, and and uh, maybe even play that game. Where in the world is James Nigemeyer? <laughs> I love it, James. Thank you so much for being on tonight. And uh, again, I would love to have you on here coming up this spring once uh, once you're on tour, once you get out there. So, man, again, great information, and thank you so much for answering those questions for us. Man, I appreciate it, Nate. Thank you for having me out here. And, uh, man, I, I enjoyed it. And, yeah, we can do it again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Guys, that was James. You, know, you talk about an angler that's experienced so many different places in fishing. And, again, I think it's huge. And he hit the nail on the head that finding the the keys in the content we talked about you know hard versus soft and old school versus new school and there's a place and a time for everything and it's up to you the angler to to find those small niches of number one what's best for the body of water you're fishing and number two what's best for you the angler you know again for me it, confidence is huge and if you get down and out you're you're going to struggle on the water so for me it's it's building that confidence but yet still keeping an open mind to fish the best presentation for the fish and if you know i know they're lethargic and i know soft plastic when they feel that bait that more life flight effect that's going to catch fish i do it if i need more reaction more crisp you know the hard bait that's what i'm gonna do so again i try to think situationally what's best for the fish and then also what's best for me the angler to present that bait uh again you're gonna have a, a winning combination but again make sure that you keep up with the current trends make sure you keep an eye on what's trending because i think it's it's a big thing because you know again some of these trends are going to stick forever. They're going to be a, a, a winning, you know, award-winning bait. Some of these baits are, are going to be just a, a fade away. Then the old school stuff, things that have always caught fish, a bobber and a worm, you know, old school jerk baits. Again, the old school stuff, if it caught fish at one point in time, I promise you, history will repeat itself and it will continue to catch fish and it will catch fish, you know, in a lot of situations. So again, keep all those in mind and hopefully those tips will help you catch more and bigger fish at the end of the day. Again, we just wrapped up a huge ice tournament at Grand Lake. Huge thanks to Grand Lake for hosting that event. And, uh, you know, what sparked this again, we were sitting at a, a, a seminar, again, talking about a big sports show. We started talking to people about basics of fishing. At this tournament, we saw literally old school techniques, guys putting, you know, bait that was overlooked that again isn't a current trend on the hook and it caught a lot of fish so again history repeats itself keep all those topics in mind and i hope that helps you catch more and bigger fish at the end of the day guys what do you guys want to learn about what do you want to hear about we go broadcast live every single tuesday at 5 30 p.m pacific again 6 30 here in the mountain and catering across the country but again 5 30 pacific if you guys have a certain guest a certain topic that you want to learn about that you want to hear about Comment below. Send us your comments. Private message us. Again, Tightline Outdoors or Nate Zielinski. Uh, guys, I promise you, we'll bring it up. We'll talk about it. We'll bring the guest of your choice on. Guys, we'll answer those questions to make you a better fisherman. Guys, as always, if you want to get notifications when we go live, make sure you text the keyword Tightline to 33222. So again, go to your messages on your phone right now. Text the word Tightline, T-I-G-H-T-L-I-N-E, to 33222. Uh, guys, you'll get notifications of when we go live, when you want to be following us to make sure you get all of this information. I know we're going to do some live stuff this coming Thursday from the lake, uh, but guys, again, we're going to be doing a lot of live stuff, so always make sure you text those keywords. And a huge thanks to Bass Pro Shops, guys, for letting us go live from their page, also being the presenting sponsor of all of this information. So again, huge thanks to Bass Pro Shops, as well as all the other feeds that are following us tonight. So again, huge thanks to Bass Pro Shops Denver, uh, as far as that regional goes, as well as Tightline Outdoors, James Nagermeyer's 
Facebook page there, uh, as well as Ice Fish Colorado. And again, if you want this, guys, go to Tightline Outdoors. Go to your browser again on Facebook, go to Tightline Outdoors. Give that page a like. I promise you, it is full of information to make you a better angler. So again, as always, guys, send us a message of what you want to talk about, and we will see you next week as we do every single Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific. Again, I'm Nate Zielinski. Thank you so much for joining us.